table. And we remember, we remember so much. And when we remember and when we comprehend and when we think deeply about everything that this table means, it leads to worship. And as our choir sang, what worship does is leads us to communion, relationship. Where we know you and you know us. Father, I pray for your grace this morning as we approach the table, as we spend just a moment thinking about the great love that you have for us. Father, we, we will not be able to comprehend unless your Spirit does something within us this morning to glorify yourself. Our mind just will not get it. Father, we ask for your grace and your amazing kindness towards us that you would quicken our heart and our mind and our soul so that when we approach this table here in a minute, we at least get a little bit more to your glory. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you've got your copy of the Word of God, if you'll join us in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Before we look at our scriptures this morning, I want to do uh, something a little bit different this morning. I want to make a provocative statement, okay? It's kind of shock therapy kind of deal, okay? Uh, take it in the grace in which it was meant, so, you know, those who want to lynch me afterwards kind of slow down. Okay, I'm trying to do this on purpose. I want to get a reaction out of you. I want to get a rise out of you, okay? I'll, I want to make a provocative statement to you. And I want you to see in your heart and soul where it measures to you on the, the shock meter. Zero being put me to sleep. Ten being I'm ready to start the, you know, charge the stage and beat you with a hymnal. Okay, so somewhere between zero and ten, the statement that I'm about to make to you, this provocative statement, where does this register? Okay, y'all ready? God loves you. Now, I bet for most of you, on your shock meter, other than the fact that you're greatly relieved, it's nothing really all that bad, and your shock meter, that probably registered somewhere around uh, a one and a half, a two. And I find that odd. Because in any other context, when someone plops those words down in a relationship with you, it changes everything. You remember the first time that your wife or your husband or your girlfriend or boyfriend said those words to you? Can you remember that? We've been married 21 years this year, and I still remember the first time that my wife said those words to me, and not just in the, oh, you're so much fun, I really love you. I mean, really the I love you, right? I remember the first time I tried to say that, very you know, goofy boyish to her as well. But it changes things, right? I mean, you're in this dating relationship and you're wondering, what does this person think about me? And suddenly the words are there. I love you. Changes him. Or, have you ever had someone say those words to you that you did not want them to say to you? Right? You're in this kind of, you thought you were in a friendship, you thought you were co-workers, you thought you were just hanging out, we're just having, you know, we're going to the movies, we're playing tennis, we're going out, and then over coffee one day at Starbucks, boom, there it is. It's on the table, you know. I love you. Like, whoa, it just changes everything, right? And yet here we are in church, and we, the statement comes out, God loves you, and it's kind of like, well, we knew that. What's the big deal? Or consider the fact that if you were to look at a pie graph of all of the world's religions, you know, about a third of the world claims to be followers of Christ, about a quarter of the world claims to be followers of Islam, about 15% of the world claims to be followers of Hinduism, about 7% Buddhism, the other piece of the pie is a bunch of different little stuff. But in all of the world views, other than the one-third of Christianity, in all of the world views, in their understanding of whatever they define divine to be, do you realize that even in their framework, there's no comprehension of a God that is personal, that is able to know you, and you are able to know Him? None. So in Islam, they, they see Allah as a creator and sustainer. You can know His will. You can know what He wants you to do. 
but you can never really know him because he has no personality. Matter of fact, to speak of Allah as a person with a personality is blasphemy. So there's no personal God that can know you and you can know him where this God can say to you, I love you. I demonstrate love towards you. Hinduism is a belief in a creative force uh, called Brahma that uh, is embodied in approximately 330 million different gods. Uh, not, not knowable, but just this force. Buddhism is, there's no even real such thing as divine in Buddhism. Buddhism is a, is a system of thought where you're trying to perfect yourself and ultimately through the cycle of reincarnation and suffering, you get to the place where you're so perfect that you enter into nirvana, which is the place of non-existence. I mean, ultimate reality in Buddhism is no personality. And so most of the world's view of whatever divine is doesn't even believe that there's a God that has any kind of personality that can say to you, I love you. And yet in the Christian gospel, this is exactly the Christian gospel, is that God, who is a person who knows you and you can know Him, says to you, I love. And yet, most of us have, have heard those words so many times on our shock meter, they're, they're pretty far down here. Our theme verse for the month of April that kind of hangs over everything we do for Easter is Romans 5.8. God demonstrates His love towards you. And that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. God shows to you that He loves you. Easter is this display. Easter is this, I want you to get it. I want to show it to you. Easter is the, what else can I do to make you realize how much I love you kind of display. God demonstrates towards us that He loves us. This morning as we approach the table, I want us to read a passage out of Ephesians 2. For one reason, I want by God's Spirit and grace this morning for us to be overwhelmed By God's love for you. That's all I want to happen today. Ephesians 2. If you've been memorizing the, the scripture verses in the bulletin the last few weeks, you've been memorizing Ephesians 2. And let me just say one more time. If you're not working to memorize scripture, there's a level of spiritual maturity in your life you're just not going to get to. When you work to memorize scripture... You are soaking your mind and your brain in the Word of God. And you may not remember word for word, chapter and verse, what you memorized six months ago, but if you spend a lifetime every week striving to memorize something, what happens is your mind gets soaked in the Word of God. Your heart gets soaked in the Word of God. You begin to think in Scripture. You begin to feel in Scripture. You begin to speak in Scripture. You begin to pray in Scripture. You begin to worship in Scripture. You'll sing a hymn and suddenly you'll remember five, six, seven Scripture verses that all say the same thing it'll change your walk with Christ that was a free advertisement okay be working towards the memory verses in the book we've been memorizing Ephesians 2 this is perhaps in all of scripture one of the best descriptions of God's love for you and I, I just want you to be overwhelmed with this I want you to picture God saying to you for the very first time I love you he just plops it out there on the table. And it just changes everything. And listen to the description. It begins with a description of who we were when God says, I love you. That's Romans 5, 8 said, God demonstrates his love towards us when we were perfect, when we got our act together, when we were really lovable. No. God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were still sinners... He says to us, I love you. Look at this description of Ephesians 2. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead. No spiritual life within you at all. In the trespasses and sin. Those two words, the word trespass, is a word that means to deviate from the path. Sin is that Greek word harmatia, which means to miss the mark. It's the image of, a, of an archer shooting at a target and missing the bullseye. But notice the phrase that says, in which you once walked. This were not mistakes. 
This was not I was aiming at the target. I was just, oh, just a little bit off. This is not I was trying to, to stay on the path when it was so thin. This is saying it was a deliberate by choice. We deviated from the path on purpose. The reason you didn't hit the target is because you weren't aiming at that target. You were aiming at this target. And this is the description of us. You were dead in your sins. You were deviating from God's path. You were aiming at a different target. Notice he says, you were following the course of this world. In the New Testament, the word world is used sometimes just to describe creation, sometimes just to describe this place where there's a bunch of people. But most of the time, world is, is to describe in opposition to God. So that the world is a worldview, a thought process, a way of looking at life, an orientation. We might use the word culture. We might use the word worldview. It's everything that is in opposition to God. It says, we were following the course of our culture, following the course of the worldview of the world around us. We were choosing to go that way. Next phrase, he says, following the prince of the power of the air. You may have different words for that, the, king, uh, the kingdom of this air. It's another word for Satan. We were followers of Satan. The spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience who is the spiritual forces of darkness? That, that phrase, sons of disobedience, means children of the devil. So the spirit that's at work in the children of the devil, we would call them demons. I mean, you hear what Paul is saying, you hear what Scripture is saying to you about who you were when God said to you, I love you, you were dead, you were deviating from His path, you were aiming at a different target, you were following a worldview that is in opposition to God, you were following the spiritual forces of darkness, the very demons that are at work in the sons of disobedience. You get this picture? And then he says, among whom we all once lived. It's real easy for us to read this and say, you know, maybe this has been true of some really bad people, but, you, you know, I was raised in church. We all once lived, Paul said, in the passions of our flesh. Flesh is not only these great words in the New Testament. The word flesh talks about our sin nature. Everything within your sin nature that is contrary to God, contrary to righteousness, that part of you that is unholy, that is unrighteous, has passions, has desires, has cravings. And he says, we were dead. We were living in those passions. And we were carrying out, or your translation may say, gratifying the desires of our flesh and of our mind. We were pursuing what our mind wanted to do, what our cravings and lust wanted to do that was contrary to God. We were going hard after that. And he says, and we were by nature children of wrath. Your translation may say object of wrath like the rest of mankind. What that means is all of God's wrath. Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. Every reason that there is a hell, every reason that there is a place where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, every reason that there is a place of outcast where God is going to outcast everything that is evil, all of the reason for that, you were a target of that. Because you were dead in your sins and trespasses, deviating from the path, aiming at a different target, following the course of this world, following the, uh, the spiritual forces of darkness, gratifying the cravings of your sin nature. Your mind was bent, but God. You're going to put the gospel into two words. That's what you put. But God. We were there, but God. Notice what it says. Who is rich in mercy. Verse 4, that word rich, an abundance of stuff, overflowing, an excess of mercy. Because of the great love with which He loved us. What an incredible statement. Why is there an Easter? Why is Jesus Christ, why did He die on the cross for your sins? What in the world would motivate a God who has a place of wrath prepared for those who are living in rebellion against Him? And here you sit. You're dead in your sins. You're deviating from His path. You're aiming at a different target. You're following the course of this world. You're following the spiritual forces of darkness. You're gratifying the cravings of your sin nature. Why in the world would God react to you in any way other than just to consign you to wrath? Why is there an Easter? Because... 
of the great love with which he loved you. Isn't that incredible? God loves you. Keep reading. He made us alive together with Christ. That's an incredible statement. He quickened us. He made us alive. We were dead. How do you get from being dead to being alive? It's all God's work. He convicted us of our sin. He opened our eyes so that we could see and understand the gospel. He gave us a spiritual hunger so that we would crave and want to come towards Him. He made His light shine in our darkness so that we could see. God did this work in us. We were dead and He made us alive. And He made us alive with Christ. How in the world do you put us in the same prepositional phrase as you put the name of Jesus Christ, the second person, the eternal triune God, the emblem of the fullness of righteousness, and yet we are going to be mixed in with Him. Why would you do that? Because of the great love with which He loved us. Raised us up with Him, seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that. If you don't get anything else this morning, if you get verse 7, if nothing else, if you just check out, hang in until verse 7, then you can check out. In the coming ages, He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Do you, do you hear what Scripture's saying? How long is it going to take you and me, to get a complete grasp and understanding of the amount of God's love for you. How long? You take someone who's a new believer in Jesus Christ, and they just become a new believer, and they're washed in God's love for them. They begin to read Scripture, and they begin to pray, and they begin to go to Bible studies, and they begin to go to church, and they begin to hear more and more of God's love. How long is it going to take them before they really get it? Ten years? Twenty? Forty? Maybe if they follow Christ for sixty years, will they get it then? It's not what Scripture says. Well, we won't fully get it until the trumpet sounds and we step into heaven. Then we'll get it. Then we'll see fully. Then we'll know. Then we'll understand. Then we'll get the full depth. That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that when you get to heaven and you are sitting next to Jesus Christ day after day, year after year, and He's trying to show you the immeasurable riches of His kindness towards you in Jesus Christ, you're not going to get it the first year. You're not going to get it the first decade. You're not going to get it the first 10,000 years bright shining as the sun. You're not going to get it then. You're not going to get it in a million years. You're not going to get it in a billion. You're not even going to get it in the first age. It is going to take God ages before you begin to even scratch the surface of His immeasurable riches towards you expressed in kindness in Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And here we sit, and we throw the statement out, God loves you. And many of us have heard it so long, it, it's way down here in a one-two. And God says to us, you'll be in heaven for ages. And you'll just be beginning to comprehend the immeasurable riches, the great love with which I have. So we come to this table. This table represents just the, the short version. When God's people were in bondage in Egypt, slaves in Egypt, and God rescued them. He sent a man by the name of Moses and, and used some plagues so that the king of Egypt will finally let them go. And the last plague was that tenth plague. The firstborn of everything in Egypt was going to die, except for God's people who took the blood of a lamb and put it over the doorpost of their house, and then they ate that lamb as a fellowship meal within their house, and the angel of God passed over those homes that had the blood of the lamb. And every year, the Jewish people, God's people, were to celebrate this meal 
every year to remember that event. What they didn't realize is that everything of that meal was pointing towards the Messiah. Just the whole thing was pointing towards the Messiah. And then one day on the night that Jesus was arrested, he's celebrating this Passover meal with his disciples and he began just to say crazy things. Took the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. He took the cup instead of the usual Jewish blessing and said, this is my blood poured out for you. Basically what he was saying is, I am about to give my life, I am about to die on the cross for your sins. Why? Why would he do that? Because of his great love towards us. So this morning, we come to the table. And my, my prayer is that God's Spirit would so fill this room that we once again would be overwhelmed by God's great love for us. And when you hold that bread in your hand, and when you hold that, that cup in your hand, you will hear the Savior say to you, I did all of this when you were dead in your sins. Because of my great love for you, and my love for you is so deep, you'll be in heaven ages before you get it all. And we can worship. I invite our deacons at this time to come forward, and let's prepare. As our deacons are coming forward, would you join me in prayer as we prepare our hearts to worship because of His great love for us. Father, forgive us when we throw out this words, God loves me, and it doesn't really just rock our soul. Forgive us that we think we've, we understand it. I know we've heard that before. Yeah, we hear today from Scripture that it's going to take ages before you'll be able to show us even the beginning layers of the immeasurable riches of your great love for us. So Father, today we observe the supper. We remember you died on the cross for our sins. Why? Why would you do that? Because of your great love. So Father, during this time, would your spirit wash all over us as we remember and as the choir sang, it's the remembrance and understanding that leads to worship and it's that worship that leads to communion. To your glory this morning. It's in Christ's name.